So thank you for the introduction. Uh, so as I said, um, I will present another, uh, yet another cryptanalysis of multilinear maps, uh, this time for the GGH uh, 15 uh, candidate. And it's a joint work with Jean-Sébastien Coron, Moon Sung Lee, and Mehdi Tibushi. So let's start with a uh, multilinear map uh, application. So one of the first applications multilinear maps were described for was non-interactive key exchange for more than four players. So you have four players here, and you have a public board with some public parameters. And the idea is that each player is going to generate a secret value, and it's it is also going to encode this secret value in a public encoding and send this public and publish, broadcast this public encoding. And these public encodings are going to be on this public board. And then each uh, of the, the, the party can take uh, the three other encodings and their own secret value and apply this key generation procedure. Uh, so on their secret value and the free uh, and the encodings of the other uh, parties. So uh, for example, the party A here is going to take the value A, the secret value A, and encoding of B, encoding of C, encoding of D, and apply this key gen procedure. And B uh, here will take his public, his secret value B, and then take the three public encodings A, C, and D, and apply the same key gen uh, operation. And the thing is, what you want is that key chain in these four cases give the same result so that you can extract the same key K. So if we look at instantiation of such uh, key generation algorithm, uh, for two parties, it's essentially Diffie-Hellman, and it's, it, it comes back to 1976. So uh, you just uh, the secret values are element of ZP, and the encodings are G to the secret value. Then in 2001, Zhu explained how to use bilinear maps, how to use pairings in order to achieve three parties. And in 2003, Bonnie and Silverberg, uh, they said, okay, if we don't have a bilinear map, but a multilinear map, uh, then we can achieve N parties for N as big as uh, the size of the multilinear maps. Plus, uh, plus one. Uh, but also in this paper, they say that it might not be possible to use the same technique as we used to obtain pairings in order to, to obtain multilinear maps. So it remains an open problem, uh, it, and it's still an open, open problem to get the multilinear maps uh, from Bonnet and Silverberg. Uh, in 2013, um, what we used instead of multilinear maps is uh, approximate multilinear maps were introduced. And these approximate multilinear maps, they also allow to uh, derive a key generation procedure for n, n parties. So we essentially have three uh, candidate schemes uh, of this approximate multilinear maps. So the first one from Garg, Gentry, and Alevi at Eurocrypt 2013, and then the CLT scheme, uh, uh, Crypto 2013, and the gentry of alivi scheme of TCC 2015. And in this talk, uh, I will actually describe a cryptanalysis on this third candidate. So why do we care about multilinear maps? So nearly everyone here know that they, they are really interesting. So they are the, one of the first application that is described is this non-interactive key exchange. So it's a simple application because it's a generalization of uh, Diffie-Hellman. But of course, the key, okay, okay, Ooh. okay, the key um, uh, thing that we could build from uh, approximate multilinear maps were, was I/O, so indistingu uh, indistinguishability obfuscation, and this has on itself a lot of really exciting application, a lot of theoretical um, consequences and everything. So it's really, really the big uh, construct construction from uh, approximate multilinear maps. And also, we can build a lot of really exciting uh, new uh, technologies, like multi-input functional encryption, optimal broadcast encryption, witness encryption, AB for circuit, and a lot more. So it's really, really interesting to understand 
uh, what, how to construct um, such multilinear maps. So if we look at the candidates we have currently for approximate multilinear maps, they're unfortunately based on new hardness assumptions that are not standard. So you have a lot of assumptions. Um, so some of them I named them myself, but uh, you have this multilinear DDH, which is a generalization of DDH. Uh, in a public setting and in a private setting, you have decision linear problems, subgroup membership. You have this, uh, these problems here that are kind of interesting on their own from, for some theoretical work uh, to, to get to construct IO. Uh, you have this kind of Stradlich set induction pr uh, assumption that also are used to build IO subgroup elimination or graph indu inductions. And what What's happening right now in the community is to try to figure out how hard these assumptions really are. So if you look, for example, at the GGH13 scheme, you have some assumption we know that they are broken and we have attacks against them. Uh, some assumption they're like kind of broken sometimes, it depends how you instantiate them. So for example, in this work we'll show uh, that uh, a graph induction assumption on GGH13 is also broken in a way. When you look at CLT13, uh, it's not exactly the same thing. So this one was orange before, now it's red. Uh, this one, I put it in green, but it's more like we don't really know if it's secure or not. We're still trying to figure out what's happening. And these are all like a subset of all the attacks. Again, uh, these are honest assumptions. Uh, for GGH15, so it's kind of a different multilinear map. Uh, it's mainly this graph induction uh, RNS assumption. And in this work, we show that uh, there are some graph, uh, for example, the graph of the key exchange that is not secure. OK, so our result is the following. So there exists a polynomial time attack against the key agreement, the Diffie-Hellman key agreement protocol when instantiated with the GGH15 multilinear maps. Uh, so what we do is actually, uh, we don't, uh, we're looking at uh, a protocol that takes place and we generate an equivalent encoding for one of the user. And if we're using this encoding in the key exchange, then we recover the secret key. Okay, so just small comments on the result. Uh, we, our attack comes from the fact that the graph that was used uh, in the graph induction RNS assumption for the key exchange protocol uh, is uh, there is a way to attack it. It does not mean that all the graph induction assumption on GGH15 are broken. And in particular, you can build a candidate for indistinguishability obfuscation following a certain graph structure, and we don't know how to break that. And also, there is a paper on Eprin, but I didn't check the detail, that says that some of the graph uh, give pseudo-random encodings. So you have security for some of the graphs. Uh, also, so Alevi in this, um, in this uh, note on the Eprin uh, tried to, to, to take this graph induction thing and to put it for GGH13. And in that case, also for the Kiagimran protocol, we can uh, have another attack. It's not really an extension of this one, but it's, it's similar in some of the idea that breaks uh, also in that case the, the key agreement protocol. Okay, so um, in the rest of this talk, I will describe uh, multilinear maps, uh, what is the candidate, what is the protocol, and how we can break it. Okay, so if we go back to uh, asymmetric multilinear maps, so you have an encoding of an element A uh, for in a group G to the L. So that's why uh, that's how it was described by Bonnet and Silverberg. Uh, you can add and subtract elements in the same group, so that's easy. That's just the addition. Uh, you can zero test at any in any group. So the zero testing it's true. So it means it encodes a zero if it's an element if it's a neutral element of the group. So it means the an element that is encoded is zero. And you can multiply. So in the asymmetric multilinear map described by Bonnet and Silverberg, you can take uh, d elements and put all of them together and uh, get an encoding in the target group of the product. 
when you look at approximate multilinear maps, it's, it's, it's nearly the same. So instead of being in a group, GL, you're encoding with respect to a lab, la label, L, uh, and now uh, you, you can still add for the same label. You can zero test. It's the same except you can only zero test for a specific label. And the multiplication is slightly different. Here it's graded. So it means you can, uh, multi you can multiply two encodings corresponding to label I and label J if they are in relation in a cert for a certain relation. And this certain relation, it's what uh, will uh, um, be different in, the, the, dif in the, uh, the candidates we have. And for example, for the GGH15 candidate that we'll look at, uh, these relations are given by graph structure. Okay, so what is this candidate? So first we're working um, over a ring. Um, so it's polynomial uh, mod F, where F is an irreducible polynomial of degree N. And you're also working in RQ, sorry, RQ, so it's R divided by Q, QR. Uh, and we have some public values, and these public values will be vectors uh, in R uh, that correspond to certain vertices. So what is an encoding? So actually, you're encoding something with respect to a label, a label and this label will be a path. So a path from a vertice U to a vertice V. And an encoding for this label is actually a matrix uh, in R, such that this vector times this matrix is the secret value times the, the vector that corresponds to the, to the vertice V plus an error vector, mod Q. So once again, the encoding here, it's a matrix, and it send this vector to this vector multiplied by the secret value, uh, and it's a noisy encoding. So obviously, you can uh, add or subtract. So if you're taking two such matrices for the same label, uh, then when you multiply on the left by A to the U, you get A times A to the V, and plus B times A to the V. So it's A plus B times A V, and plus a vector no of noise. Uh, the question is, uh, what's happening for the multiplication? And the multiplication will be possible if uh, the paths uh, are compatible. So it means if uh, you have an encoding for the path UV and an encoding for the path VW, then you can have an encoding that will be for the path uh, U to W. So if you write it down, it's just the matrix multiplication. So you multiply these two matrices, and when you write it down and you multiply on the left by the vector AU, uh, then you have A times B times LW. And you have an error term here. And this thing, uh, it reveals a lot. So first, uh, we, it means we can only encode small plain text, because if you're encoding uh, large plain text and then you're multiplying, then this uh, might become really big. So if you keep on multiplying, it will be really big, and then you, you cannot do anything. And the other thing is that here, the, the encoding itself is, uh, is present. So actually, the encoding also are small. They actually are nearly trapdoors for these vectors here. They're noisy trapdoors, in a way. Uh, so if we sum up, we can do multiplication when the paths are compatible. Uh, it's just the matrix multiplication, and um, the, the plain things are small and the encodings are small. It doesn't matter that much for the rest of the attacks, but just uh, I wanted to point that out. Uh, also, how do we zero test? So actually, there is an extraction procedure, uh, and the extraction procedure is you have an encoding uh, of a secret S for a path U uh, to V, and if you have the AU, the vector AU, you can multiply and you get S time AW plus E. And this thing is, this E here is small. So it means the most significant bits of this value here will only depend on the secret exponent S. So if you have another encoding uh, that also goes to, uh, that encodes the same value, um, but, that, but it's randomized differently, it will still give them the same most significant bits. So it means you can extract something that only depends on S. So in particular, 
uh, it's really easy because if the s is equal is a zero, then when you will multiply this two thing, you will get something that is small. So you know that the encoded value is a zero. So zero testing is uh, means that the extracted value is a zero. Okay, so if we sum up uh, on this slide, uh, in the graph-induced multilinear maps, you encode relative to a path. It's a noisy encoding. You can add or subtract such encoding for the same path. You can zero test. Uh, so the zero test is one if A is zero and U is actually the source uh, vertex. And you can multiply along path. So if you have a path U to V1 and, a path and an encoding from the path uh, V2 to W, you can multiply them as V1 is equal to V2. And you get an encoding uh, relative to the path U to W. Okay, so what is the key exchange protocol? So uh, I will describe the um, protocol for three parties, but you can extend it, you can extend the attack for more parties. So when you're using GGH15 in application, you have to specify the graph that you will be used, using. So this is a graph for the key exchange uh, in GGH15. So the first row will correspond to user one, the second row will correspond to user two, and the third row will correspond to user three. Uh, so what is an encoding? Uh, so the encodings, they will be from these vert vertex to these vertices. And an encoding, so uh, ij, for example, it's such that aij uh, times this encoding, it's small a times aij plus one plus a vector noise. So actually the encodings will be here on the edges. And you're, you're doing, so you're multiplying here and you go here, and you're multiplying here, you go here, you're multiplying here, you go here. Okay, so what is, uh, okay, it's here. So what is the key exchange protocol? So the um, user are generating encodings of secret values S1, S2, and S3, and they're putting them in the graph in a round robin fashion. It doesn't really matter that it's a round robin fashion, but it's, uh, it's, it's described like that. Uh, so the, the thing is here, uh, you can see that each user can uh, take this first, uh, the fir user one can take the first row, multiply the encoding, and get an encoding of S1 times S2 times F S3. And same thing for user two and user three. So what they do is actually they, pu they publish these encoding, but keeps these encod uh, encoding secret. Um, and then this vector here, they're not public. So what they have is the public parameters uh, contain these three uh, vectors here, and they only reveal this value here. So it means if you're just looking at that, you cannot, you cannot recover S2 here because it, uh, you cannot infer it from here or from here because it's not the same matrices. Uh, so the user here, uh, but the user I, himself, he knows the secret value on the missing edge, and he can compute the, the resulting encoding and extract the key as the most significant bit of the result. So that's a protocol. Um, and how do we do that if we don't have uh, all the, the, the small vectors? Uh, so actually what happened is that you have a lot of uh, public encodings over these edges, and you're computing a subset sum. So here, user one, for example, it takes a, a set in one to the n, and it generates an encoding of S1. It doesn't know S1, but uh, this encoding, it can generate it on this, path, on this path here, on this path here, and on the path here. And user two is doing the same, and user three is doing the same. Question about the protocol? Okay, so let's, Let's try to break it. So the setting is the following. We have all these uh, public parameters. So these public parameters, just what I sh have shown here. So it's these matrices C, uh, I, J, and they verify that the vector times C, I, J is equal to this secret value T, I, T, I, J plus, etc. So you have all this uh, public parameters, and what you have is that you're actually looking at an ongoing key exchange. So you have all this relation from the, the key exchange, but this one you don't have because these are the secret uh, from the users. 
Uh, otherwise, the relation is with S1, S2, and S3, and that's the secret of the users. Okay, so the goal, what is it? It's to recover the shared secret key. So it means you want to recover K, which is an extraction, a key gen of S1, S2, S3, uh, over one of the paths. So either the first row, the second row, the third row. So our attack is as follow. We extract a linear relation uh, over uh, S1, over the TI, T1Js, and it's a variant of the Cheon Royal attack against the CLT13 scheme. And it does not break the protocol right away because the coefficients are large, but then we can compute an equivalent encoding uh, with, a sm with a small error, and then we can use that in the protocol. So, um, so what is the idea in the nutshell is that we have encodings here of S1 that are public. So we'll just forget about the first row, and we'll try to fix S2 and S3 at the same, for the same value, and then compute this line here and this line here, and compute the difference, it will give an encoding of zero, and we'll do that for a lot of different values of S2 and S3, and this will allow to construct a matrix. And then we can do something with the matrix. So, um, okay, so if we look at uh, the public parameters, uh, so these are the public parameters of the row two and three. What I do is first I fix T3. I forget about the indices in the index J for uh, T3. Uh, and then, it's, it's going too fast, okay. Uh, and then I'm merging the two first equation. Uh, anyway, I'm merging the two first equations, uh, so it means uh, I, I can have uh, two encodings, and this time it's uh, from the first vertex to a second vertex uh, here, and it's an encoding of T1 times T3, or, and T2 times T3, and then an encoding of T2 and T1. And what I do then is I fix uh, all the Gs, and that's the thing I will be uh, varying after. So then I get two encodings here, and the thing is when I look at the difference of uh, this encoding, as I told you, we have two rows that compute the same thing, so I look at the difference. When I look at the difference, it will give something small. That's what the protocol is. So when you compute exactly and you, you, you write everything down, you get uh, that this difference is T1 times T3 times this error vector plus an error vector times the encoding. The encodings are small minus T2, T3 times an error vector, um, minus an error times an encoding. But all the values are small. It means we get something that is true over the ring and not mod Q. Uh, so then now if we only look at the first uh, element of this encoding, we can write this equation as, uh, as an inner product of two vectors. And then I can do that for a lot of different um, uh, public elements. So it means I can extend that in two matrices. Um, so you have a product of matrix A times B. And so if you're doing that, but you're not uh, building a square matrices, you're building one matrices with one line more, it means that you can find a vector uh, in the kernel of W. And since uh, with I probability B will be invertible, you can remove that. So it means you have a vector in the kernel of A. Uh, so it means you have a linear combination of the T1J that gives zero. And the interesting thing about that is that we only use public elements. So if we use one secret element instead of one public element, we have a relation with S1 and the TIJs. And so once we have this relation, uh, the, the problem is that when we look at the encoding we can create, because we have the coefficient, then the, the noise vector is really big. So that's a problem. We cannot use it directly in the protocol, but what we can do is instead of using line uh, two and three as we did, we're using line one and three, and we're running exactly the same thing, and then we can correct this error vector, get something with the same error vector. So we can subtract and then we get uh, an element that is verifying what we want. And then we can use it in the protocol and recover the, the shared secret key. So to conclude, uh, we described an attack against the key agreement of GGH15, even with the safeguards that were in the papers. Uh, and it, it, it extends in a way to the variants of Halevi. And we don't know, uh, with this attack, we don't know to build a non-interactive four-party key exchange that is not going through I.O. 
uh, but, and it gives some insight on the graph-induced uh, assumption. Yes, uh, so these are some open problems, and thank you for your attention.